If you're looking for a place to hang out, figure out where you can take the next step in your dairy farming business, then you're in the right spot. Welcome to the High Performance Herd podcast. Here we will inform you what you can do today to future-proof your business for tomorrow. A big thanks to our sponsors from Terra, IDEX, Kuru Diagnostics, Taz Herd, Tasmanian Dairy Trust, Zoetis, NHIA, Data Mars. I'm your host, Andrew Savage. Enjoy this episode of the High Performance Herd podcast wherever you may be listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode and jump on our Facebook group, The High Performance Herd Project. Hi and welcome to the High Performance Herd podcast. Today I am lucky enough to bring you Ryan Luckman from Waimati Vets. Ryan is changing the game as far as how we use rumination data and collars for on-farm decision making. Ryan graduated as a veterinarian 15 years ago, working for the veterinary centre at a predominantly dairy-based practice in Waimati. With a passion for working for farmers at the herd level, he has also pursued further qualifications in veterinary epidemiology, combining these skills with the perfect storm of a growth in Allflex SCR collars in the region. This presentation provides his perspective on the opportunities that this technology offers, as well as providing real-world examples of how the data can be integrated into farming practice. Hi Ryan, welcome to the High Performance Herd podcast. Tell us something about yourself that most people don't know. All right. Oh, thanks for having me. Uh, well, I'm a bit of a craft beer fan, and a few years ago, uh, a group of us called the Abandoned Husbands, who were a wee home brewing club, got together and uh, went commercial for a couple of years. So we were in our own brewery, Hunter Hills Brewing, and uh, sold our wares and dabbled in the in the restaurant business. Uh, wouldn't wouldn't recommend stick to dairy, but um, yeah. The abandoned husbands. I love, I love that. Yeah, there's probably a few uh, dairy farmer wives out there. Yeah, the, the, like they're been wives. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The the abandoned wives did not like the choice of name. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so you tell us about your work with cow collar data. How, how did you evolve from general vet work to bring this focus on collar data? How did it start, and what problem were you trying to solve? Uh, so the, the initial problem we tried to solve was back in back in the first COVID lockdown back in 2020, I guess. Um, and one of one of the issues that I'd always struggled with was talking with farmers around their heat detection or their heat detection skills. And you know, we'd, we'd have data sets showing terrible return rates, and um, you know, some you know, heat detection was probably really high on the differential list for helping improve the the repro performance on these farms. But no one wanted to believe that they could be bad at heat detection. It was, you know, a real blow to the guts to believe, you know, and, and no one would actually buy into this. And I thought with the growth of these collars, um, one thing they give you is things like an optimum mating window. And so we, we did a wee trial where we married uh, married up ovary follicle sizes with optimal mating windows from the Allflex collars. Um, and create a package called Heat Check, which we could um, take out to commercial farms, um, give them feedback on whether the cows they're putting up were likely to be on heat or not, and give them some real time, make real time changes with their heat detection. Um, so that was my first dabble, and what it gave me was because I had to pull out the data and look at it. I kind of got under the hood of what was what you could actually pull out, what you could look at retrospectively and forward in real time and change reports and stuff, and yeah, from there it was away. Yeah, that's fascinating, and um, people talk about COVID gains, I guess, and uh, what COVID did is forced us to maybe look at things a different way and um, how we can do things online a bit more, and um, although the pandemic had some pretty horrific impacts, <clears throat> there was also um, some good to come out of it, and this is one great example of that. What, what some, are some of the things you've discovered along the way? So we've looked at quite a few things now. So yeah, basically each time we've looked at stuff, we've, we've tended to go retrospective. So pull out a heap of data from a lot of farms, look at 
look at patterns and then try and implement them into real time kind of diagnostics. So one of, one of the first things we looked at was the rumination recovery post carbon. Um, and at, at the time we were, we were quite fortunate. We had a nutritionist who'd come into our practice, Sue Mackey. She'd spoken a few times and she'd, um, she would, she's a real proponent of uh, once a day milking of colostrums in the, in the first period, take the stress off them, get, get their voluntary feed and take up and match the energy demands in the early lactation period. Um, and so we had some farmers who were doing that, some farmers that weren't, some farmers that were doing a hybrid model um, where they would start off twice, uh, once a day and then, you know, chuck them in two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And what we were able to see was that the rumination recovery rate on these farms doing once a day milking was just way, you know, far, far superior. They were, they were um, getting those rumination rates up. And when we then looked at the effect on uh, in-calf rate based on, well, especially the farm that had done some variable days of milk on the once a day system, um, we actually saw like a 10% spread between the lower and upper quartile at six week and calf rate performance. So it certainly looked like it was um, making a difference. And at the same time, we had some, I guess, anecdotal, but um, uh, corroborative evidence across the practice without collars where people would change to once a day in that period and had some really good outcomes in terms of um, reproduction. And so we, we tracked that through with our pre heat rates and stuff. And it, it really did seem to flow on that this once a day milking post carving was having a, a really big impact. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I guess w we did actually share one of the graphs that you produced uh, in the High Performance Herd Facebook page, and it had the three different uh, frequency of milking. And one of them was once a day variable. Um, can you explain what once a day variable was? Is, is that a mixture of you know, your sort of sixteen hour type um, <laughs> yeah. milkings? No, no, that's that once a day variable is a shear milker who was a big believer in the once a day system, but he was also uh, very concerned about milk production losses, and so his wallet was making him put some cows into the vat at two days, some at three days, some at four days, some at five days, out to eight days. So <laughs> his um. Yeah, his his drive for milk in the vat created this amazing amount of unnatural, not cow-based, but people-based variability. So it was perfect for us in that first year because we got to then analyse what how many what the average rumination rate or total rumination minutes on these farms for the first seven days to look at the effect of that variable variability on um, repro outcomes. Yeah, that's really really interesting. And for you, I guess, you know, you talk about the wallet and quite often with technology uh, and milking frequency, it is the farmer's mindset that gets in the way of, of certain practices and um, especially, you know, in robot systems too, it's really hard for farmers to deviate from something they've been doing for so long. What was the sweet spot you found as far as uh, milking frequency and the six-week in calf rate? And I guess, you know, talking about loss of production, how long should you stay on, on once a day milking and what's the optimal yeah. year? <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, the the jury's probably still out. We, we probably need a few more controlled studies to really, really get into the nitty gritty. But most of our guys are settled on around the 10 day mark. Um, we've got some creeping back to eight or even six days, depending on their system. Um, but there, there hasn't been a real clear outcome on those farms that it's um, maybe having as big of an impact. Um, so yeah, t 10 days, we've kind of ended up as a sweet spot. In terms of that milk production loss where um, anecdotal, you know, all anecdotal evidence or, you know, we're getting reasonable amounts of data sets now, but historically what we've seen is, uh, say, the, the research, which was kind of Dexel research, uh, well, it must have been 15, 20 years ago, said you're likely to lose around, say, 5% milk production by going three weeks on once a day. So no, no one's ever really looked at this tighter period when we're not, you know, we're not approaching anything like peak and we're probably not um, risking so much of that uh, memory development of thing. But what we've seen anecdotally is a lot of people will 
because they don't lose that body condition as much early on, they'll either peak higher, so peak, you know, reach peak, have a little bit more body mass behind them and, and go for a higher peak, or actually hold that peak out far longer. You know, so they're, they're hitting, you know, mating in you know, 4.5, 4.6, 4.7 body condition score, whereas they might have been 4.3, 4.2. And so I think it's, it's just giving them the opportunity to hold that peak for a bit longer. Uh, and saying that, we had uh, one of the worst production years uh, in our total region. The area was back about 5%. So I think it'll take a few years to really get a good handle on what is the ultimate impact. That's right. So it's a really slow burn and a big rabbit hole to go down to then start talk about, um, you know, how many cows got in calf earlier and what that does for production the following season and that type of thing. So um, it's a, I guess it's a holistic approach. So you've done a lot of work around springers as well, what transitioning, um, springing cows into calving. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so this was um, one of the – so we, we do collar repro reports for all of our farmers. So we, we, we chuck in about 12 different reports out of a few systems and look at, you know, kind of what were the drivers at each of these areas throughout the season because um, I think the collar data is amazing in terms of the microanalysis you can do. Um, but one of the things that came out, we were seeing some farmers were having really good – day zero, you know, on the day of calving rumination rates, and some weren't. And initially we looked at things like, you know, are they, you know, are they picking the, the amount of the spring as often? Are they leaving them on the yard for four hours and eating nothing? You know, there were a few, few variables, but what we eventually found was that the farms that were having really high rumination rates on day zero had really good rumination rates as springers. Um, the ones that were hitting really low rates were usually, say, sitting around th- on, on these Orflex systems, say around 300 minutes a day, it was not a good outcome in terms of that day zero calving. So if you imagine on at the point of calving, you, uh, you know, or the cow, not you, the cow uh, stops eating, mucks around, has the calf, and and then will slowly come out of that um, that dip or that nadir point in rumination rate. And I like to think of it that your rumination rate pre is really kind of just an evidence of your total feed or total fuel that's going to be within the system to drive them out. So if if you're going to drop by a third to a half in rumination rate going from springers into day zero, if you're starting too low, you you just don't have that recovery or that fuel on board to get you going. And we we then, I think, uh, I'm not sure... If your listeners are aware of the Dairy NZ work done quite a few years ago that looked at reducing metabolic issues by feeding, uh, putting them into a slightly negative energy balance in springers. And the, the sweet spot there was um, settled on at 90% of maintenance, which is really good. And like we've, we've had some great success with it. But people have really taken the screw your springers hard um, to, to reduce metabolic issue quite to heart. And so when we were looking at a lot of these diets of, say, 300 minutes, they're only feeding 60% of maintenance or lower. Um, so they're putting them in this massive hole. Um, and so we, we, we do energy budgets for our clients. So we'll say, right, what's, what is the sweet spot to hit 90%? For our guys, it's usually, say, 10 of green and 2 of straw. And that would usually hit around 450 minutes for that springer mob. And that gets a really good bounce out from day zero. And you can track it like the farm's doing, say, 300 minutes. Some of them will have some really good recovery lines, but they've got huge amounts of um, health alerts in, in that post carbon period. I think that spring is, is really making a big impact on that. Yeah, that's really interesting. And we've previously talked about uh, here in Australia, the lead feeding, which has become very common practice, but not so much in New Zealand, so I'd be really fascinated if we can't dig into uh, the lead feed system for springers and how that's looking. So, well, um, yeah, no, really exciting stuff. You, you've done a lot also of benchmarking, uh, preheat benchmarking, um, and maybe you could tell us what sort of numbers you're dealing with because some people might think, oh, well, you know, is, is it really relevant if it's uh, a couple of hundred cows? But you've got a pretty big data set, so I'd love to hear about <laughs> that pre preheat heating da- uh, benchmarking and how that's looking. 
Yeah, so th- this again came out of our um, when we did our our call our repo reviews at the end of the season. Um, we were we had about 30, 35,000 cows at that point with collars on. So we were able to put them into a huge data set and basically create, you know, what's normal, what are our quartiles for performance across a whole heap of different areas. And one of the key ones was pre-mate benchmarking, um, pre-mate heats, um, which we broke down into three groups. We did um, heifers, who I guess are the, the future of your herd, and if, if they don't perform well, you know, there's no long-term financial gain, all that kind of stuff. And also they often perform drastically differently to the rest of the herd. Second group is one that we kind of created this metric that we call the engine room. So these are three to seven-year-old uh, carvers who have will be carved at least eight weeks by the planned start of mating. Um, so they've got, if, if we think about confounders, they've got ages and against them and carving datas and against them. So they, they should cycle. And it allows us to create a group that we can compare between farms quite easily. It's very benchmarkable. But also, they should be the highest performing herd on your property. And if they're not performing, it's a real clear evidence that your system or your farming system is broken rather than if they're performing really well, you might have really poor herd pre-mate benchmarks, but that could be a hangover from you've had 10 years of poor reproductive performance, you've got heaps of late carvers. What we want to know right now is, is what you're doing now working or do we need to make some changes? And then we do, we do benchmark the herd. And so from that, we, you know, that huge data set, what we, we create a quartile, so performance, so lower, mid, upper quartiles. Um, and what the whole aim when we've had all this data has been, how do we build something that gives real time alerts to farmers so that it's not getting to the end of the season, finding out that, oh, you did terribly, here's where you went wrong, we'll see what we can do next year, which is what we've had to do probably historically before collars came along. Whereas what this gives us, that we've got a system that's recording heats on a daily basis, you have to do absolutely nothing. So we were able to come into our clients this year, four weeks out from the plan start of mating, and say, right, currently across these three groups, you are performing either in the upper quartile, you're going well, you're on track, probably no changes needed. But on a lot of farms, say, especially with heifers this year, they were performing poorly. So we had a lot of farmers who were performing in the bottom quartile. The heifers weren't cycling. But, but we're telling them this now four weeks out from mating. So instead of getting into mating, realising we've got an issue, probably having to put a heap of cedars that get poor conception rates because you know the, the heifers are not on a positive energy balance, they're, they're not cycling, we're able to make some changes four weeks out. So we've had you know, people splitting heifer mobs out, preferential feeding, um, you know, looking at health issues, you know, so there's, there's a whole heap of things that we can do right now that will ultimately make an impact going forward. Yeah, well, it's really powerful information to, to have, isn't it? Um, just a quick question around the heifers. At what point are you installing or are the collars being installed on the young stock? Uh, usually over the winter, so, the, so their first winter coming into calving. Um, so that they carve down with data. We've yeah, got, that's really interesting. I think we've got one farmer who's put yeah. We've got one farmer who's put them on the R R ones or R twos for um, that first mating, but um, that's not very common yet. Yeah, oh, that's really neat. I was just going to move on if we could to um, talk about weekly conception rate over mating uh, and how I guess you're using that data to measure um, conception over mating and that type of thing and you know I'll be really interested to see how you're using that for those farmers yep so um, yeah the cons- you know you, you we've probably always been able to do weekly conception rates with just general data but the issue we've faced is that the data is uh, to, to be brutal you know somewhat dirty in the fact that we're relying on human to pick these heats or miss them. So we've, you know, the, the data is, is very muddied by if you've got poor heat detection as an issue underlying it, you can't really read into it. Whereas what this gives us is this, this really clean understanding of week by week, 
number of cows submitted, number that got pregnant, the conception rate of that week. We can track the trend on how that's changing. When you combine that with the rumination data, the production data, and I use the milk protein data, percentage data, you can you can see get really cool ideas on when cows are in negative energy balances versus positive energy balances. And what we're seeing is that the concept, weekly conception rates are following those trends. So if you've got a sudden big drop in milk production or um, a drop in your protein percentage, you'll often see that week you'll see these massive drop dips in conception rates. When you're trending down, we'll often see that, that um, dip in conception rate come up to three weeks in the three weeks post. And I think... Um, you know, in, in New Zealand, we've got this real clear issue that we keep seeing again and again of a dip between week three and week six. You know, we'll be flying out the gates up to week three. And I think a lot of that's to do with those heats are set up, or those eggs or oocytes are set up um, in that pre-mating period. So they're, they're often reasonably good quality. We've got cows not hitting peak. They're not, they're not massively drained for energy. Then we hit uh, start of mating, um, we hit peak production, we often hit peak, peak, hit peak grass allocation, and we pull out our supplements. And, and we're quite consistently seeing that a lot of farmers go into a negative energy balance at this point uh, when you look at the production, protein, and rumination. And this, you, you can, you know, it got to the point with, when you were making these graphs that you could pick what the week by week conception rate trends were going to be based on. On the other data, it was it was actually really consistent. So it really highlights the importance, I guess, of nutrition, uh, bringing nutrition into the piece, and um, you know that grass quality, I guess, and and understanding those on farm decisions and what repercussions they may have. It's pretty easy just to turn the tap off, tap off, uh, you know, your PKA or your grain or cut back, but um, yeah, like you say, it's often at a crucial time. Yes, and, and I mean, as you say, with the grass quality, that's what we're seeing. Like, um, uh, we've got, you know, one of our common things that people would do in that period. So we're, we're right on the edge of, um, you know, do we have enough feed, do we not? And they'll they'll feed, uh, or they'll put a bit of a feed bank ahead of them in terms of grass cover to, you know, just get them out of that hole in case things happen. But what we're seeing on those farms is, your rumination levels are going through the roof when you get to kind of that mating period, which is probably higher NDF or higher fibre content in that grass as you lose quality. And um, when we, so we do energy calculations at peak for our farmers as well. And the when we're feeding, say if you're trying to get 18 kgs of grass into a cow, um, if you drop the quality by 0.5 of an ME or or, if, or even a full ME because you've lost quality, the impact of that on your system is the equivalent of taking two or three kgs of supplement out. You know, it's it's massive. And so I think that quality is that key driver is is critical. Yeah, that's a really good point you've made there. Um, if we bring all this in, there's a lot of lot to disseminate and bring in from the data and that type of thing. And I always try and keep things at a a higher level as possible and you've done a great job of doing that because uh, I'm sure that you know a lot bigger words than I do when you bring all this together how are your farmers using this on farm you know each day to help make them daily or, or seasonal decisions um, so we th this this was the, the as we talked about the start like we'd find something cool out but it's no good unless we can have the farmer making changes in real time otherwise you know what's the point um so one of the issues that i felt with a lot of these systems is they were set up um initially for say barn systems you know so really good if you're year-round mating and feeding a really consistent diet of a tmr with our systems it, it probably wasn't set up really well so we actually um sat down with all flex and redesigned um, a whole heap of reports and dashboards to make them, uh, I guess, suit what we wanted. So we, um, for transition, we rebuilt some reports which allow our farmers to um, basically understand on day zero, day one, day two, day three, and up to 20 days, 
what's the rumination rate for each day post calving for their herd. And so let's say they can, in real time, know that on day four we're having this drop, we need to make some changes. And they get really instant feedback on it, and the farmers get really good at it. You give them a target, and they problem solve. And pretty much all, all my, you know, I guess that's what consultancy is, but all my stuff I tell other people is just what a farmer's told me after they've worked out what worked really well. And so you say, oh, I'll try this. <laughs> Look at this graph. Um, yeah, so we're able to build that and transition. That transition report's really cool. And there's a few other things around automating the once-a-day system. For mating, we were able to set up um, some cool dashboards where you could actually visualise how your speed of um, uh, speed of premate heats um, broken down to calving pattern. Um, so a lot of the a lot of the systems will present non cyclists as a as a, say a report, but you have to be say calved sixty days or forty five days to come on to that report, and it can be I've had. To disappoint a lot of farmers when they first put it on and say, I've only got eight non cyclers. <laughs> yeah, but your 300 late carvers who haven't been eligible for that report yet. Um, yeah. And your yeah, same with rumination. So, yeah, by having having all these built into the system as real time things, knowing where to look, I think it's, it's, it's put the power in the farmer's hands on these. Yeah, that's really. It is really powerful stuff, and yeah, there's so much information there that we can get, um, and the dashboard is a, is a real key to that, or the ability to be able to extract that data, which is what we're sort of working on here with this this project as well. Um, so where do you think this is all yeah. heading? Like, what does the future look like? What are you working on now? And, yeah, that type of thing, I guess. Yeah, so in the, in the short-term future, so we're um, at the moment we're just – looking at say with the pre-mate benchmarking reports that we're just doing at the moment um are there similar things that we can do throughout the season that that we can benchmark or give early reports that i guess takes the information in your system that you've got access to and presents it in a really easy to digest way so that you have a real clear understanding of say your transition or your pre-mate or what's happening in mating so you get an early alert um, without, you know, because I guess a lot of the reason why people put these on is they want life easier, you know, so how can we how can we present that data in an easy way? And uh, one of the key ones we're just working on at the moment is a, um, improving our collar repro review reports, so uh, basically re- essentially rebuilding um, the fertility focus report but to make it collar specific, you know, what's the extra information that we can get out to define? Um, because the bonus with the information from collars is we can tell you that your issues across your farming system were at springers or the first four days of calving or the 10 to 14 or the pre-mate period or in this mob or this, you know, this age group or in the mating period. You know, so we, we can be very highly specific on where you need to look at changes in the future. And then, yeah, building the system so that you can know if you're achieving those targets in real time. Yeah, that's really neat. Um, I had a question. It's a bit of a deviation, but I guess a lot of farmers will bring collars into their system as a you know labour saving device or a, a, like potentially a silver bullet. Um, you're dealing with a number of farms. Is there someone on that farm that takes ownership of the collars and the information and reporting back and forth to you? Um, do they put sort of systems in place to engage all of the staff? Or how, how are you finding this actually flowing from you providing the information to them actually acting on farm? Yeah, it's a real mixed bag, obviously, with all farms are. Uh, on some ones, we engage with the whole farm team. You know, So we'll go out and do training, under, have the whole team aware of the targets within, the, within these dashboards and reports. And so... You know, they, and I really like that method because they, the workers and the people actually sitting in the fences, then know what's going on and, you know, they can kind of, um, you know, alert each other. Oh, you know, you did a tight break there because they've suddenly dropped to 300 minutes, you know, and, you know, they can really feed back. Someone, someone on the farm certainly has to take that ownership though because the, you save labour in a lot of areas, but if your data 
inputs, you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have your calves in, or if you don't have your cows in, or cows collared, you know, you don't you don't get this data. In, in terms of those changes, um, we say with the pre-made benchmarking reports we just sent out, they'll go to the the key farm people for that farm plus uh, their prime vet. So, um, and I think that's been one of the key things we've found in with these elite packages that we launched with Orflex. Um, one of the key things was that they won't let you put it on unless you engage with your vet and the vet gets training because you you do want some support on this, um, you know, how do you interpret this data? What do you actually do with it? What are your options to make changes? Um, it can potentially be a bit overwhelming if you're just left to yourself. But having, yeah, basically a discussion board and being able to have your vet or maybe your farm advisor or someone on board, I think is key. That's right. And I get the feeling this is going to be like an iPhone that's just going to keep evolving and updating and there's going to be new things we can look at constantly. So it's about keeping oh, ahead of the massively. curve. <laughs> it's... Um, it's amazing. I went mountain biking at the weekend and there's these e-bikes flying around everywhere and you just think, man, you know, when did that happen? <laughs> so um, I just really <laughs> love all this information you've given us. It's been fantastic. For farmers who are listening, uh, what would be one key takeaway you think that they should take away from what you've been talking about today? Um, I think if you're going to get collars, you've you know, you can probably get time savings and get some heat detection and that, I mean, by themselves, they'll probably almost pay for it or will pay for it, you know. It's, but to me, the the exciting or the future or the, the real opportunities for your farm is utilising the data that comes out of it to make, you know, real informed choice decisions around what you can do. Um, and so I guess, yeah, just making sure that, I think the second thing is making sure that um, you're in it for the right reasons, you're getting it, and you're, um, I guess, prepared to do that. Don't do it with data. That's right. Yeah, no, I love that that takeaway. It's uh, like you said, it's not just um, set and forget. You've really got engaged with this process, and and putting the device around the cow's neck is really just the beginning. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Hey, we really want to thank you very much. You've offered everyone great value. Uh, a lot of people out there, especially in Tassie, uh, really in Australia, I guess New Zealand's the same, deciding uh, with this payout year, is collars something I should be looking at, if not this season, then next? And I think you've really offered some great insights into you know um, what to expect and what to maybe consider that maybe you hadn't thought. So really want to thank you a lot for giving up your time this morning and coming and catching up with us. All good. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the High Performance Herd podcast. Thanks to the sponsors, Fonterra, IDEX, Courier Diagnostics, Taz Herd, the Tasmanian Dairy Trust, Zoetis, NHIA, Data Mars. Feel free to subscribe and review the podcast share it with your friends the more the merrier jump on facebook search the high performance herd project and you're very welcome to join the high performance herd private facebook group if you want to see a video of this podcast jump on youtube or www.highperformanceherd.com where you'll see a link to these sponsors for more information and more information on the high performance herd project which is a real life dairy farm spring block calming right here at Tassie. Thanks very much and we'll see you next week.